Hello everyone. In the past terms, we have been focusing on designing objects. We use the first principle of OOP called data encapsulation or information hiding. The reason for data encapsulation is when you hide your data modeling, hide the details about how you model the objects and only allow the outside world to interact you through the public interface, the good thing about that is when you try to modify the detailed modeling, the, all the other objects, they don't need to be modified. So that's the first principle. And starting from this term, we are going to talk about the relationship between the interaction, interactive objects. We have seen the relationship called has a relationship. For example, a deck of cards, the deck, deck object has card objects. That's a has a relationship. And also about the use a relationship. Um, for the sample project in last week, we see the use a relationship. When a player draw a card, it needs to use a deck object. The deck object has to deal a card, then player can draw the card. So the deck object is passed in as a parameter um, for the draw card operation of the player object. So that's a user relationship. Has a relationship is more prominent than the user relationship. Usually user relationship happens just in one or more functions, but has a relationship is prominent. You have it as your member. Uh, this week, we're going to focus on another relationship called is a relationship. The is a relationship, how about, for example, if you're trying to model the class registration system at PCC, uh, you need to model faculty and student. Faculty and the student, they have something in common. They all have address, they all have name, they all have G number. And we can discover a is a relationship if we introduce a third class called a person because student is a person and faculty is a person too. So the relationship among person, student, faculty is a, is a relationship. So we can make a super class called person and make faculty and student a subclass. And faculty is a person, student is a per person, we call it an is a relationship. To model this is a relationship we use inheritance. You can see inheritance everywhere actually. So for example, we have cars and some cars are SUV, some cars are minivan, some cars are sedan, and but they're all cars. And car has some general attributes. So you can see is a relationship. So the super class has some common attributes and provide common service. In the subclasses, for example, SUV has its own special features. So when you implement SUV, you can just focus on the what's special about SUV. Or when you uh, implement minivan, you focus on what's special about minivan. You put all the common attributes in the service, push it up in car. This way, you only model it once. So inheritance, it encourage this code reusing. It's all about the code reusing. And that, that's not all. When you do code reusing, that means you only implement it in one place. That's in the super class. You push it up, this common attributes and common service. You push it up. In the, in the super class, you do it once, and all the subclasses, the inheritance, this, those common attributes and the common service, they don't have to do anything about them. They just got them for free. And so that this way, the subclass can focus on what's special about the subclasses. When you have implementation in one place, that's not just the code reusing and save your uh, development time. It's also uh, very beneficial for code maintenance. If you have it in one place, later on, if you want to change one attribute or change the service, you only need to go to one place. That's a super class. That's where you implement. 
You don't need to go to all the subclasses. So that make your code more re more maintainable. Inheritance helps us in a way. Number one, code reusing. You don't have to write as many lines of code. Number two, make your code more maintainable. Because when something needs to be modified, you only need to go to one place to modify it. Next, let's take a look at inheritance. This is a relationship in a sample project. In this sample project, I'm trying to model um, the social media post. Social media post, there are different type of posts. This message post, this picture post. And message post and picture post, they have some common attributes. For example, you have to model the author, um, the timestamp, and number of likes, and maybe a list of comments. So those are all the common attributes you can think of um, for message post or picture post. Because we want to do the code reusing, we want to implement those common attributes only once and provide the service in one place, we introduce this super class. Sometimes we also call it the parent class and base class. That all means the same thing. We call it base class, super class, parent class, and make message post and picture, picture post the subclass. Um, sometimes people call it derived class or children class. So message post and picture post, the relationship is message post is a post, picture post is a post. We make those two subclasses of the post class and we push up, push up all the common attributes and service in the post class. This way message post and picture post can focus on what's special about message post and oh, what's special about picture post. Now let's take a look at the project. So this is a class post. We implement all the common attributes here. Username, timestamp, number of likes, and a list of comments. Uh, here I use the STL container called list. Um, you can look it up in c++.com about the detailed, of, uh, detailed usage of list. So those are the common attributes. We have a constructor. So when, when they create a post, they need to tell me uh, who's the author. And I have the get author, get likes to manipulate the attributes here to provide access. And all those three functions, the constant member functions to provide access to your internal data. And uh, I have three other member functions to to modify the attributes. Like, unlike will change likes attribute, and add comments will change the comments attributes. So those are the common attributes and the service that are needed to be provided by both message post and picture post. We put it in this post we call the super class or base class. Now let's take a look at the message post. We want so the first line of this one. When you declare message post, we do a colon public post, which means message post is a subclass of post. So this is how you establish the inheritance. And the keyword public it's called a public inheritance. We will talk more about other options, public inheritance private inheritance and the protected inheritance. But for now, let's leave it as it is. So it's most of the class inheritance are public inheritance. Um, now let's take a look. So you establish this relationship, say message post is a post. This is an important line. After you do this, you inherit all the public and the private members from Post. So you can you can imagine what's inside the post. Those private ones, those private private attributes, message posts all have them as well. And the public 
Member functions, message posts get them for free. So you can imagine message posts got all the public member functions and the message posts got the private one. So um, all because of this line, you establish this relationship, say, uh, message post is a post. So you inherit everything from post. But there's one catch. Whatever is private in your parent class, you inherit it, but it's still private to your parent class. You don't have access to them. So even for message posts, after it inherit all the private member uh, data members from post class, message posts still don't have access to the attributes to a private data member of post. For example, for print function, this is a public member function of message post. Inside the print function, if print is trying to access the private data in post, for example, it's trying to access number of likes, no, you can't, because that's, a, that's private to your parent class. So about inheritance, you inherit it, it doesn't mean you have access to it. The access modifier are still there. So what's private with your parents is still private with your parents. You still don't have access to it. It's sort of like you inherit a, a big treasure box from your parent. But what's private, there's a key, there's a lock there, then it's still locked. If you don't have the key, you still cannot open the box. It, it is yours, but you don't have access to them. So uh, that's one important thing you need to remember. What's private is still your parents' privacy. Uh, you inherit it, but you don't have access to it. Then how do you access those private member functions? You have to go through public interface. That, that's, that's all you can do. And at this point, I think we should introduce another one. Uh, we have, for all the members in the class, we have private, we have public. Actually, there's a third one called protected. Protected data member or protected member functions, they mean something for the subclass. So the subclass have direct access to the protected field, either data member or function member. If it's protected after you inherited the subclass, they have direct access to them. In pure OOP, protected is discouraged because it violates the first principle of OOP, it's data encapsulation. If you allow your, your subclasses to have direct access to your data member, later on when you modify your data member, your subclasses are going to suffer. So uh, that violates the first rule of o, uh, the first rule of OOP. So use protected with caution. So, but that that's protected. Protected just means the outside world they don't have access to it, but your children they have direct access to them. That's protected. All right. We just talk about inheritance. We say there is a relationship. After you do this line, you inherit all the. All the members from your parent class, what's pri private is still private to your parent, but you have access to protected and the public one. Now let's take a detailed look at the implementation. Um, before we do that, I'll show you the picture post. The picture post, very similar. And um, picture post is going to focus on what's different about picture. That's a picture file name and or location and the picture caption. For message post, it focus on its own special thing, that's the text. So the public function just uh, manipulates the text attributes here. The public function manipulates the file name and the caption attributes. All right, now let's take a look at the implementation. So the implementation for post class uh, not much new about post class here. So you implement the post, uh, the constructor, initialize the username, timestamp, and number of likes, and uh, the other functions are uh, straightforward. The print function just uh, print the post. 
All right, so that's a post class, nothing new here. Now let's take a look at the message post class implementation. So first of all, let's take a look at the constructor implementation. The subclass constructor has some task to do. It should first initialize its parent, then initialize itself. That's always the principle of constructor implementation. You need to, because you inherit the data members from your parents. So it's a part of you. You have to initialize them. And the trouble here is when you're trying to initialize them, you don't have direct access to it. And actually, it's a good thing. If you don't have direct access to them, you don't need to worry about them. Your parent class should have a way to initialize itself. So this is what you do. You invoke the constructor of your parent class. You see this author? This author is implemented in your parent class. So you ask your parent class to pass it up to say, please initialize the author. Here's the author. Then you initialize yourself. So the implementation for constructor, you need to remember, first initialize my parent because I inherited. It's a part of me. And I'm responsible to initialize them. But I don't have direct access. I'm going to invoke my parent to initialize itself, then invoke, uh, then initialize my own data attributes. Get text uh, is straightforward. But now let's take a look at the print function. For message post, the print function, you see the print function look like a void, print, constant. And now let's take a look at the, the post class, void, print, constant. They're identical. So you see the, the print function, the prototype in post class, and in message post class, the print function is identical. So this is called function overriding. So we learned about the function overloading before. Overloading meaning in the same scope, it could be in the same class or in the same file. In the same scope, you reuse the function name. So you use the function name more than once. You have more than one function name the same thing. Then you have to make sure the parameter list are different. Otherwise, the compiler wouldn't know which one you mean. So function overloading meaning within the same scope, you use the same function name more than once. You have more than one function, it's called the same name, but you have to make sure the parameter lists are different. That's called a function overloading. Function overloading just meaning you like the function name very much, but the parameter list has to be different. Now we see something called a function overriding. Overriding meaning from the superclass to subclass, you have one function, you have one or more function, they are called exactly the same name with exactly the same signature. For function overriding to work, the prototype has to be identical. And this is always happened between superclass and the subclass. Like the same function prototype show up in the superclass and the subclass. This is called function overriding. So. That means message post inherit. So now think about message post inherit print function from the superclass, but it's defining its own. Overriding meaning I inherit uh, some functions from my parents, but I don't like it. I want to change the behavior. You want to either add more to it or you want to totally override it. You don't like anything about it. So in our case, the print function in message post just need to add more stuff to it because message post, post got the text, not just the author, time step, number of likes, or uh, a list of comments. So it need to include this one. So the overriding for print function in message post, it needs to add more stuff. So let's take a look at the function um, overriding. Let's see, message post. So let's take a look. So for print function, you're doing the overriding. Uh, but first of all, you say, I like what my parent did, but it's not complete for me. So you can invoke it. This is how you invoke the inherited member function. You just say post colon colon. That's 
That's what you're trying to say. I want to invoke the print function inside post class. So if you don't, now think about, if you don't do this, you just say print, what happened? If you just say print, you're invoking yourself. That's a recursive call. So you have to say post colon colon. This way you are invoking the print function you inherited from your parent class. Then you add more. So this is called uh, function overriding. So um, from your from the subclasses, you can always invoke the parent class function. Um, if that function, like you don't have naming conflict, if you're not overriding it. For example, inside the print function, if I want to invoke get timestamp, you can invoke get timestamp, and you don't have to say post colon colon because uh, there's no naming conflict. Here, you have to say post colon colon because you have your own print function as well. If you don't have it, you, if you don't do it, you got a function, a, a recursive function there. So, function overriding. Function overriding usually takes in two shapes. One shape is just like this. You invoke whatever you inherit and add more. And another one is you completely forget about the inherited one. You, you, you don't have to invoke the inherited one. You implement your own. When you implement your own, still remember you don't have direct access to the private data member. You have to go through the public interface. For example, if you say, I don't like the print function formatting in my parent class, um, I still want to print out the timestamp, print out the, the username, number of likes, or the list of comments, but I don't like the format of the print function, then you, can, you, you don't have to invoke the print function. You just need to invoke the public member function of your parent class, like get timestamp and do some formatting, get number of likes, do some formatting, that, that's perfectly fine. All right, so about the inheritance implementation, um, the two things new we talk about, one thing is how to initialize the inherited data members in the constructor, this is how you do that. And another one is how to do function overriding and you can invoke your parents function and oh you don't do that that's fine function overriding just meaning you inherit some function but you don't like it and in order to do function overriding i i have to stress this the function prototype has to be identical from return type to parameter list to this constant they have to be identical for overriding to happen all right, so that's the inheritance part, and we implement this relationship about the as a relationship, message post, picture post. They have an as a relationship between post, and the as a relationship enable them to uh, reuse all the code inside post uh, class so that they can only implement what's new about them. So now take a look at your message post or picture post. It's much simpler. It doesn't have to worry about timestamp, author, number of likes, uh, or a list of comments. All right, now let's talk, take a look at the client class. The client class is a news feed, so kind of like the newsroom. The news feed is keeping track of a list of message posts and a list of picture posts. And it has an add picture for a post, the add message post, and the print fun the print member function so the news feed is just a, a client a client class who use the class hierarchy we just pictured here so if i draw a, a the news feed class it, it won't belong to this hierarchy it's a use a relationship it use the post or you can also say it has a relationship because it has picture post and has message post inside it. And uh, again, if you not you're not familiar with the list class, you should look it up in the uh, STL library. And just as from the previous sample code, I use pointer to object. I put pointer to object inside the list container instead of the real object. 
and this is important. Actually, we use pointer extensively. We call it light weighted objects, and you will see uh, in next week's lecture um, the reason we use pointer and it's number one, it's light weighted. Number two, it enable you to do something called the dynamic bonding. Thank you.